Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I will be moderating this session. Uh, in this session, we will be receiving Dr. Can Karadoğan's presentation. Uh, Dr. Karadoğan occupies the main chair position in both our uh, music technology department in Istanbul Technical University and uh, our infamous Miam Studios. Um, the title for his presentation today will be um, The Experience of Studio Recording and Recording Technology. He will share his approach and give insights on uh, this topic, this particular topic, for about 30 minutes. Then uh, there will be a question and answer session afterwards, uh, and that would approximately take about 15 minutes. Uh, John Ojam, you may begin now. Thank you, John, for the nice introduction, and thank you all uh, from the Medinea Network and uh, from our side, Miam, to make this happen. I'm really happy to be here, hosted here uh in this uh, chain of webinars and uh, it's great to share all this together with people outside of our reach in, in uh, apart from our town and country and all that so i'm really happy to be here that's why i got inspired and tried to make a more heartful presentation content regarding this topic and you know regarding of what i know about this as far as i can tell so um when we think about the experience of the studio recording, I would like the audience to think about this following question. What would you feel when you are about to participate a studio recording session? So this, of course, goes for people who are going to perform or going to record or produce and all that. But the first immediate keywords that, you know, uh, comes to my mind, I wrote them down. Stress, boredom, excitement, euphoria, bankruptcy, confusion. So when it calls down that, it doesn't mean that all of this should happen or you know we should take, experience all of them step by step. But I hope that this conversation will ease the situation and make you know, parties understand each other in a more clear way. Why do we have these keywords? We think about our roles in the projects. Um, if I am experiencing stress, probably it's because I'm about to perform and I'm not, not prepared, or I'm about to record as an engineer and I'm not prepared either. I didn't do my homework and all, so that could cause stress, obviously. Or them, it could be exhausting hours and days of an engineer or a performer who spend their days and nights in studios, and that can be really boredom, and especially those who know from the business, the lack of vitamin D happens in studio people because they don't get to see the sunlight in a regular fashion. So boredom has some also healthy health consequences. Euphoria could be what we want to have to lean on. We want to create something that will live on forever. Indeed, a recording now will live on forever unless somebody shuts down the, the, the DSP servers of Spotify or other music state platforms. It will live on forever. So if you do something good, that's a great feeling. Bankruptcy is always a question when you invest into music production, uh, you might always check, okay, is the studio worth the money? And I'm working with this guy or this person who is per uh, performing, is he gonna nail it? Is this gonna really be a good recording? And then of course, excitement could be this project means a lot to me for many personal or artistic reasons. So the role of the actors changed the perspective. But going back, like about 30 years when why did i ever begin to record music at the first place that was because i was playing in several rock bands uh, from high school on to university and beyond still play i was listening to my heroes and i was trying to understand why those albums sounded good i remember a moment where i was listening to pink floyd's dark side of the moon and wish you were here albums on a cassette on both sides and I was blown away. I couldn't understand how they did that. That of course made me ask the question, realizing the difference between a rehearsal room sound and a finished album. Um, they never come together. So there's something magical going beyond and I want to dig into that. So we, we started recording with my bandmates. But I always asked, I remember constantly asking myself, can I make a living out of this? That's me here in Hamburg performing with my band in Germany in the year 2000. And I had the vision of, of course, being an artist, but I didn't understand what was going on behind the glass. So I always 
introduce this question to my students in my class. Does the society need really music produ producers? So can we make a living out of this? Uh, we sure do, but why? So that's, uh, of course, the thing. I think the key is um, not what really people think and all that, but of course the meaning. And going back to the core uh, issue of musical communication. So one of my, the, the people that inspired me was Oak Felder, half Turkish, half American producer of R&B and hip hop. And uh, you can check his TED talk uh, with this title, A Song is a Conduit of Emotion from Me to You. That is a rule that never changes, actually. Whatever format you do, how you, you know, uh, take part in a musical process, it could be a concert, it could be a studio recording, doesn't matter. So this is back into the core. All you do is actually make this happen. It doesn't have to be a song, of course. It could be like Ozan was talking, a classical session, a video project. If it doesn't get the emotions transfer right, then it's not successfully uh, completed. So, and now we'll dig into how that should be happening in terms of a studio experience. I summarized, as I said, I was inspired about <laughs> this speech uh, to really share some personal, uh, you know, insights on this. And I listed the things I like about the job. Uh, before all this, I was a software programmer and I was working alone coding this stuff for a company. And then becoming a sound engineer made me have a direct access to my clients or my uh, guests in the studio. So I have this feeling of a pleasure of cooking. So you mix certain sound and serve them to artists and you immediately see their reactions. That's one of the things I mostly enjoy. Another motive was I contribute to musical genres that I cannot perform, such as classical or jazz or Turkish art music, folk music, whatever. I'm a you know rock singer songwriter, so that's what I can perform. But making them happen makes me really happy. Uh, become a band member of such an ensemble and support their performance. That's one of the main satisfactions I have in the control room with the band. Uh, the fourth thing is if the communication is correct, magical things might happen in the studio that I experience in, let's say, 40% of my recording sessions in the studio. Not all the time, but when it happens, you're really ha happy and you hear, you see an Instagram post of, of the fellow artists you recorded that they thank you, like it was a great time recording this and, you know, there's nothing compares to that actually. The fifth one is a Star Wars fantasy of mine. It's a holistic line of work with long checklists. I have the satisfaction of as if I'm Han Solo and trying to get the Millennium Falcon running up, setting up all the cables and everything together, microphones, artists ready and hitting the record button. And if the first take is done, 80% of your job is, so to say, complete. And this is also kind of a technical satisfaction, let's say. But the last thing changed my life. I made a lot of friends in the studio and I get to understand how they think and feel about music. I didn't know any that many jazz musicians before. And after recording jazz bands in the studio like for 10 years and all, I get to know how they communicate, how they talk about music and what they aim for in the studio and how they treat each other and how they talk about uh, metaphors and beats and all. This is like, as they say, the kitchen the back door of music production you see how people cook their meals so uh, and this is not to be found in textbooks about music so it was really a thing that the studio sort of provided for me um in order to understand the process i just summarized the steps of a typical studio music production this i always talk in most of my classes because it's also key. Um, this probably is more or less the same everywhere around the world, unless people are trying to do, you know, some experimental way of producing, which is also uh, very commonly found. Uh, but actually, I, by showing this, I have emphasize on this pre-production phase. Because this pre-production, if that is done, that could be done in several ways, depending on the genre. Uh, the whole studio experience and the process uh, is more efficient and less tiresome. 
if you don't do your decision, make your homework, let's say, you don't do your take, make your critical decisions beforehand, you waste a lot of uh, you, precious and priceful time in the studio and end up with nothing and the recording you've done would not be useful. So that goes for all musicians and recording crew. We'll get into details. I have these arrows here. Sometimes, sorry, uh, as Ozan said, sometimes the edit goes back to tracking, the mixing might go require another editing and then the master might, a mastering engineer might require a change in the mix. So sometimes in this process, we might need to turn back, but this is all like, um, step back and go back to the previous step and fix something there so that the other step is completed in a better way and then delivery uh, but all this can be done uh, both in home studios and in recording studios but I'll tell you the difference now to my perspective before in the beginning of 20th century recording was this it was actually all five processes completed into one process where you basically mix the ensemble by placing them. So the, the voice up front, this is a phonograph recording. I think everybody knows about this, where you there's no amplifier. So you really yell into the cone so that the needle will move and write, carve something on the wax cylinder. And so you mix things by placing, mix instruments by placing them in the room accordingly but of course the resolution wasn't that good and even just after the recording you couldn't listen to it right there so you have to trust the conductor say if okay if everything's okay ship it and we'll go for like mass production so you know what was the advantage of this you had to be really good to go into this kind of priceless recording session what we have today is Pro Tools, as Ozan was talking now about this. Um, here you see all these audio clips of several passages of music uh, edited together like a brain surgery. So um, that's why I put here the main question on many performance minds, is this cheating? If shooting a Batman movie is cheating, then this is cheating too. So there's no such thing as a uh, work of edit is cheating. It doesn't show anything that the performer was lacking, like of a performance of interpretation, all that. This is about creating something bigger than life, something about an interpretation that is uh, combining all the bits and parts of the interpret's ideas of about a piece and put them together in one big collage. And some I think one of the first classical musicians that really understood the difference between studio art and concert art was Glenn Gould, the pianist. And he really enjoyed the process of being in the studio. Playing live, as Ozan and Peter was discussing in the previous session, has his other quality, but having a recording that will, of course, survive forever, maybe uh, should be like reflecting the idea of the, con of the artists uh, and how it's combined is that by done by this kind of editing. So for me and the crew and today's thing, this is a craft people can use or a technology and it's not cheating. It's a form of art. It's like theater versus movie. So regarding all that, uh, I need, of course, my aim is to have performers empathize with the engineers and engineers empathize with the performers so that this behind the glass back and forth dialogue uh, and the studio experience becomes better, of course. What is the challenge and the perspective of the sound engineer when they enter a project? They will be working with new artists. It's like, you know, getting to know a new person. You don't know that person. Um, you need to make sure, are they hearing how they sound? So sometimes you might want to bring them into the control room and have them listen to their takes. One thing here that we mostly experience is that uh, depending on budgets or the project structure, we don't have the person of a producer at, at, at our institute in the, in the studio. So it's unclear sometimes who is calling the shots. Is it the performer itself in the room or the sound engineer inside? So 
who's going to say this take is good artistically okay technically perfect let's move on to the next measure classification of genres is important uh, so it's not like any piano recording is the same um, even if you're having classical pianists performing in the studio recorded over 12 years or maybe more uh, with the same microphone same position same piano in the same room they all sound different because they're different people um, as I said, theater versus movie production, that is the key here in the studio. We are more into movie production. We, wa we want to create an ideal concert performance. And for this, the sound engineer needs to use the DAWs, the digital audio workstations in a creative way to help out the artist actually. So this is also in the perspective of the sound engineer. Again, the Han Solo uh, pleasure, let's say. You need to be dealing with all the signals. The technical part is totally on you. And we'll get into more detail. This is the patch bay in the studio where you connect everything to everything. Basically, it's similar to the 1950s telephone centrals that where you patch Chicago to Los Angeles and make people call, make their phone calls. So it's, the technology hasn't changed that much in the last 80 years on this. And when we look back in the performers thing, uh, the perspectives, what they go through, they are estranged by the unusual acoustics most of the time because studios are not like concert halls or rehearsal rooms. They are feeling not really comfortable because there's no audience to perform to the wall physically, literally. Or of course, you know somebody's listening there, but you don't see that person. That's why the talkback conversation is sounding like an interrogation room. Really, there's no eye contact. There's somebody listening to your moves in the room and then pressing the button. Uh, okay, it was not okay. So let's take take two again, and then that's all you get from human contact outside the recording room. Um, anxiety of causing trouble for the crew. Again, this is the topic about ethics of editing, uh, performance anxiety, uh, and then not hearing the result during the performance because this is a very uh, you know juxtaposed thing com compared to a, a concert situation. You hear something in a dead room and you don't know if it sounds okay. Um, I mentioned the other two already with the sound engineer's perspective, so that's the same. So this is what they get when you, let's say this is a drum session, you're in this room, there's nobody there, you're alone, with some microphones, multiple microphones facing you. And just having a microphone next to you, it's not an easy feeling, it's like being observed. So studio session musicians after a while they get used to this recording situation and if they get to know the technology better they understand the process of trust editing cutting out stuff or being having this uh, silence discipline uh, and then they become have it uh, getting used to it. they become familiar with the room and they begin to perform so one of the things that the engineers should make the artist comfortable inside. So how, is, how are they going to do that? What the energy engineer needs to do is a guideline. Ask the right questions before the session, because it's like getting to know the people and getting to know their project. What are they going to record? Sometimes they would misguide you, say, okay, I just need eight microphones because I have eight instruments. And one of the instruments are drums. No, with drums can set nowadays is just recorded on at least with 10 microphones. So you should really check on that. Have a copy of the score if you're doing classical production because you get to know the repertoire and take some notes on that. Make a teamwork plan and prepare the studio beforehand. This is crucial because um, things might go wrong. It's the Murphy's law. And if you're running a studio, it's always there. Murphy's ghost is always around. I have this rule, uh, book the piano tuner in time. The one, one, one rule of CK, it's not Calvin Klein, it's referring to my name. But that means if you're calling the piano tuner, you call them one week advance, and then the day before the session and an hour before the session, so that it makes sure they show up, because sometimes they forget. And that happens for all the mus session musicians also too. And also en assistant engineers and the engineers might also fall asleep. So things might go wrong. You should be, you know, uh, controlling these things. It sounds like a control freak thing, but unfortunately it's, it's like, like that. Um, prepare a microphone setup. Talk with the artists before the sessions. 
ask for reference albums. This is key, actually. And then you have to explain the workflow in the studio, too. Um, one thing here is that be nice to the performers, especially when you're directing over the talkback speaker. This is how you set your tone of language, saying, OK, we have next take. And then use the sandwich method. That is also a very com common psychological trick. You say your compliments first, you do your critique, and then you close your conversation with other compliment so that the performer will go on and do something better in the next take. Likewise, the performers should be practicing for the session, practice in the library if possible, talk with the engineer producer before the session because it's not like everything's going to be ready as they arrive in the studio or appear in the studio. They should find reference albums. I don't like composers who come saying like when I ask them, how does your music sound like? Oh, my music is unlike anything. Okay, it might be very original, but the recording and the presentation wise might be similar to Philip Glass or to Chopin or something like that. So it might be something to talk about. Uh, and then understand the workflow, obviously. Be nice to, to the control room. This is one of the requests from the sound engineering size. As in NASA, Houston rescues the crew of Apollo 13. So you need the control room for uh, to get the recording done. Um, the profession itself in the studio has this holistic approach. We combine all these knowledges together to get the recording done. I'm not going to that much detail on this, but um, when you're recording or listening to something, you need to really be thinking in various dimensions. Uh, like you might be hearing a noise, you might be hearing a wrong note, you might be hearing some electrical buzz. So everything goes into your responsibility field and you need to find out the problem and then correct it during the session. If I might compare home studios versus recording studios, we are, um, I'm not, I don't want to be fair or unfair to any of them. Uh, so both are not to be underestimated or overrated because today we live in a world where we combine both. Democratization of sound is happening, but it comes with certain consequences. We can discuss that in our question and answer session. Uh, we can make the best out of both with a good planning. So if we are doing in a, some stuff of our home, uh, just, I just gave my albums reference. I did part of the stuff at home and part in the studio. For instance, I tracked all my DI channels, electric guitar, bass at home and my MIDI channels and my effects designs and some pilot vocals uh, and had my you know sketches of the songs with some usable tracks at home. Uh, but then, of course, when you go to a studio, you can record some real drums, real vocals, and piano and strings and all that. What is why do we pay for high end studios? Uh, we pay for actually uh, isolated acoustics that gives us a better signal to noise ratio, which makes us then process the sounds better in the post production. We can get detailed microphone techniques, we can track lead vocals better. Reamp, we'll get to that in the Atmos. Uh, and then we mix with full range speakers also, of course. So all that combines makes actually a good recording. But the core actually is we use the frequency spectrum as a canvas. This is our art for both musician arrangements and sound engineering and producers. We do the emotional preparation. We create a scene. We think as, as a movie production, basically. And the key here, what I mostly refer to, microphone as a camera. So we create something bigger than life and place them in space and perspective, just like a video. And similarly, um, when you record, yeah, we have five minutes, right? Or over time. What? You have five, five minutes. Remember. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was really speeding up. You know. <laughs> Anyways, like here, an example of recording a bender, where you really put the microphone off axis to combine all the sounds that are coming from this doom, doom in the body and the tech on the tops. So musically, both information are important, but you mix them basically by turning the microphones on axis off axis response, microphone as a camera. Similarly, like sound design, music production is also based on source excitation and space. So when we think about even a dog bark in a hole in a for cinema, we think about a source, who's playing what, what is the repertoire. We 
think about the excitation. What is the general performance style? It could be um, uh, Misha Maisky playing Ave Maria, or it could be Apocalyptica playing um, Metallica on a cello. So, so the excitation will be different. Where do they perform? That's the space what we create from the recording. So uh, here are some references for movie, actually, movie and fully designed. Um, we use cliches, actually. When you create, want to create a space, you use reverb. Uh, or you record some record plays uh, some instruments in the reverberant space. So Michel Chion has one of the best books on this on regarding audio vision. Uh, so those principles actually apply for general sound design. But now the key thing, of course, adaptation is key to survival, as they say in Star Wars. Technology changes, and we need to adapt. So since 2018. I was in Hamburg for a research project uh, for about 3D audio, immersive sound. So we, me and my team in the studio with Ozan, Jan, Thailand, Oz, Lachin, all of our friends who were here also in Medinia, uh, we actually upgraded our studio, just like, I'll get to that, but uh, to Dolby Atmos. So why is that important? This is like the transition of Beatles going from mono to stereo in 1965. And now today, in 2021, everything is jumping from stereo to Dolby Atmos. And one of the successful albums here we listen to in our classes is Jean-Michel Jarre's Oxymore, came out last year. Beautiful 3D music. And as he was an expert, of course, in electronic music, his music suits him perfectly. So we upgraded our studio, putting our height speakers in here, uh, having not just the stereo two main speakers, but many multiple speakers all around, seventh layer and four layer on top. And yeah, this person is listening to 3D audio uh, as with this um, using uh, the Dolby Atmos uh, settings here. And so we're trying to understand and getting our leaving our comfort zone to uh, go into this new thing. Uh, of course, Listen to this is a struggle. This is a picture of our class here in, in the Atmos thing where we try to share the sweet spot of Dolby Atmos. But people in the end listen to this in uh, their uh, headphones. Um, so um, it's actually a good thing to really adapt to the new things. Otherwise, it's not like um, um, you cannot have the luxury to say, I'm going to remain, my music will be mono. It will be just, you know, outdated, become outdated. And after a while, people will lose connection with your music because it's not an accessible format. So now we begin to produce also, of course, in Dolby Atmos with using multiple microphone arrays and all that. Uh, and we're experimenting actually now on this. As to summary up, I... Um, what I learned through all this thing uh, is that we have to be critical listening at all times. We have to leave our comfort zones and new learn new software such as Logic Pro or Reaper and all that. We, I mostly am a Pro Tools person, but I learned Logic over the time. Of course, you need to, in a studio context and at home also, you need to have the trustworthy monitoring system. You have to follow the latest developments in the world. That's crucial. And that's why it's not like musicians don't have the luxury anymore to say ah oh, okay this is technology related i don't want to go into there no as ozan said before you have to be digging into with these aesthetics of video and audio and all this stuff this is part of your arts presentation um these both things are for mostly studio related uh, things you need to become a band member become maybe become a team member in the studio context then you get better results and you have to optimize using your resources. So what is the latest things today? We have fast processors and spatial audio coming up, virtual reality, sound design for PC games, music production via internet, and our favorite topic, AI, is also in the play. But this, this shouldn't scare you. It's not going to be that we will be listening to only AI artists. There are AI artists who are signing with major record labels, but in the end, the first rule of music always applies. 
A song is a conduit of emotion from me to you. So music is a way of human communication. It's not, I don't need to program a machine to make music for me unless, I don't know, I'm for some kind of another effect, but um, that will never go into the hands of AI, I should say. And thank you uh, for listening. Thank you, Ojom, for your uh, great insights on the topic. Uh, now we can proceed to the question and answering session. Uh, this will briefly take about 15 minutes or so, and you might write it, write the, your questions uh, to the chat session sec section, or uh, just unmute yourself at any given time. By the way, I've been speeding up with the slides. If you have any questions relating to the fast <laughs> film forward effect, we can go back and open up the session and I can show things on the studio too. I think there's a question. Go again. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Jan Jan, for this ah. lovely presentation. Thank you, Gerken. And my mustache is greeting you. Yeah, that's a surprise <laughs> for me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Long time. I, I think for many, many, <laughs> for many, it's a surprise. Uh, anyhow, I would like to ask you a question regarding to the uh, production of music for the masses and singular or atomized individuals. Mm. Uh, like, as far as I comprehend, uh, till. 10 or 15 years, the music was always being produced for masses, like multiple audience members, like for concerts, even in in-house, we were listening to things from stereo or mono. Mm. Uh, but uh, quite recently, the things are becoming binaural or like very, very individualistic. Uh, the sweet spot concept has uh, highlighted than never been before. So I would like to ask you, what has changed uh, from a producer's or like a, from a studio uh, technician's perspective of producing those albums, music? Yeah, thank you. This is the perfect question, actually, that would really complete my, complete my presentation. This is the debate since last two years we were dealing with as a Miambri recording studio crew. This whole adventure began as we set up the 3D studio in our Sonic Arts room in 2021 with Oz, Oz's uh, PhD project. And we didn't know anything about Dolby Atmos. And we were setting up this 10.1 Auto 3D Ambisonics uh, min minimal studio in our video one room. And fine, suddenly uh, Uzeli Music contacted us and said, OK, Apple Music has this problem, Hojam, you might help out. So they want to do these things in Turkey about 3D. And then since then, we were talking with Apple Music people and all the Atmos people. They wanted to promote this all the Atmos and immersive audio thing for commercial usage all around the world. So there were no studios in Turkey. And then since that, since that day, everybody first resisted the idea, saying, hey, this is not going to work, stereo is perfect, and nobody's going to have these speakers at home. And this seven plus four, this complicated setup with a very small sweet spot, that, I think that's what you're referring to. Um, then again, of course, uh, now today, when I look back into the list, we have 10 studios or 11 studios in Turkey who support this format or mixing in Dolby Atmos, including ours. We're the first university actually in Turkey to do this, and we have two studios. Uh, but the discussion still goes on. We have the headphone sets from Apple, and we listen to the stuff there. They don't sound as impressive as like they're in the room. As you know, you're a sonic artist yourself, that we have we have an acousmonium with all these speakers around. It's um it sounds real. It's it's speakers really on top of your head, the sounds coming from above. There's nothing fake or let's say, um, programmed or psychoacoustically illusionized. So, um, but then again, um, people departed from the idea, all the producer friends of ours, so, okay, this is going to work, but then we need to write music for this. I think Andrew Sheps was also referring to that too, famous mixing engineer. What's your story has to do with this format? You can tell your story with stereo, Stereo is perfect already, no problems. But 
if you need these speakers in the rear of your head, how is your you know musical content going to relate to that? Is the story about something behind you, metaphorically, physically, be above you, beneath you, all around you, surrounding you? All these things that come, you know, the story. According to your real question, I also objected to that. Okay, as, as, as soon as I put my headphones on, also with this earbuds, AirPods thing, it cuts me out of my outer world so much that if a person would die just next to me in the subway, I wouldn't hear them yelling. That's an, that's um, not an easy feeling of you know social supportness. So, um, but on the other hand, I think this thing will expand the sweet spot and we'll have some collaborative things going on. And one other reference to your question, the band More Virtusi, you know, they had this big concert in, um, it's a very famous Turkish rock band nowadays. They, made, they had this big stadium concert in, in Turkey and like with, well, I don't know, 30,000 people. And they had a movie of this concert, live concert. People asked them to do a Dolby Atmos uh, mix out of that, a 3D one. But the drummer, a colleague of mine, Kerem, he said, no, we want this to become remain as a social event. I think that's what you're referring to, Gurkham too. We don't want people to just listen to it on their own over YouTube. We want them to enjoy that in a cinema hall, but together yelling at and singing along with the songs. So that was a very conscious choice of them. And they did a stereo mix out of that. And I went to the, you know, the, the gala of the movie and you know you yell and sing along in the cinema to the concert as if you're re-experiencing the concert in the stadium and uh, and i you know congratulated them on this idea or stance let's say but uh, i believe just like the silent party things and all where people get combined uh, headphone experience or augmented reality things might it might bring some uh, collaborative experience to um, immersive sound let's say I, I also don't sympathize with the idea of isolation i after the pandemic time it's really you know depressing <laughs> also it's quite weird that all those technologies are gadget oriented or like there is some yes. sort of fetishism yes. of objects or some petroleum based thing anyways yeah uh, thank you for your very long answer. I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it was a very long one indeed. Thank you. For o- your open my Dima, like open my <laughs> okay. mind. Okay, thank you. Nice to hear that. Yeah, I'm isolated. Is it free? Can I ask? Yeah. Uh, Ooh, hi. Plot. Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi, John. Um, do you use any AI uh, AI apps uh, in your works or productions? And if you do, how do you? Uh, good question. We are not there yet, but my colleague, uh, Taylan Özdemir, who is also teaching at MIAM and the Conservatoire together, we completed one uh, PhD thesis. He was the advisor uh, about a machine learning program to sort out uh, music tracks before the mixing session so you put in a file of let's say 30 tracks of a jazz band and just by teaching those the machine let's say it will say okay these tracks belong to drums these tracks belong to keyboards and bass and all and automatically import into reaper and then group them together uh, but i think uh, as now you know they're some project budgets opening up for these um, creative industries, they say in Tubitak. Uh, there will be some things coming up from like uh, teaching machines how to, you know, learn sounds. I've heard my colleague Thomas Gerner from Hamburg, he mentioned a mixer, uh, let's say clever mixer of Yamaha, where you patch those cables in the live concert, they automatically label the channels by hearing the signal. Say this is hi-hat, this is the kick drum, this is bass and all that. This is great. And this is actually uh, my preferred vision of an AI assistant to our jobs. I, as a Star Wars fan, of course, another reference, I would say, I would like to have an R2-D2 unit, an astrodroid, astromech droid next to me, who will do this boring part and that leaves me with the creative uh, decisions to make. 
otherwise he'll be the artist and i'll be just a bystander and this is not of course ideal but that will i think that will develop let's say uh, you, you have a mix session a rock band and you can say okay please give me three uh, sketches of mix one i wanted to sound like led zeppelin other like king crimson and then the other like yes and you'll hear that in five minutes and then say okay i like the led zeppelin direction i'll tweak into that and do the rest that will save me at least eight hours for instance and then of course we'll be deciding on different things but i think the exciting thing will happen when ai will do things that we'll never foresee just like the go playing machine and i think the japanese masters days they, they were surprised by how well the machine was playing the game of go because it was totally thinking out of the box of the tradition like this master apprentice thing and this is this is really mind-blowing and a nice thing for artists i think thanks uh i once tried uh sound design with chat gpt even ah. if you can do uh, really creative things that i can't uh, think it is amazing i tried chat gp2 too and said can you please write lyrics in the style of John Caradoan, myself? And he wrote two, two songs. It wasn't that exciting, but I felt like, okay. So it's, and I did the same. I sent it to Morvetesi's lead singer, Harun, right in the style of Morvetesi. And I sent it to Harun. He said, okay, it's not, it, you know, it's, it's not good, but it's just a matter of time, he said. So, this becomes the thing like you need to be um, as an artist and a human, you need to outsmart the machine. How is that going to happen? You need to create your counterculture all the time. It's just like having a guitar pedal. You have a preset. You press that. This is the crunchy heavy metal tone. You don't like it, but you twist on the knobs and change, make it something else out of it. So this is actually how I think future will be like you know for artists where you have some presets of the ai or the machine but you then you break it because a machine doesn't create any or let's just to me no create counterculture counterculture is a very human thing it's like you know revolutionary thinking you know, that in that way yes chat gpt is good though i'm you know i'm asking all my students to use that to just get to be it's writing good code by the way in any given language matlab python doesn't matter thanks you're welcome thank you okay are there any more questions i don't see anyone raising their hands so we might as well just end the session here if that's fine. So thank you, Hojam, for the presentation. Thank and you, John. Thank you, Medinea. Thank you, Fanny, all for uh, having me here. I really enjoyed this. And um, for further questions, you, you can always you know, contact me via my email on Istanbul Technical University. I think it's also on the Medinea Network on-air session too. So thank you.